right? BLG, we're a subsidiary company of Beef and Lamb New Zealand. We have our own board. We're funded by levies, but we double dip and we get some money from the government too. Our big main job is to provide infrastructure to help with service. We're not on the job of breeding rams and bulls. We'll leave that to you guys. Um, we're about assisting people with making profitable choices. Um, and so in that sense, we do infrastructure. Uh, our main stuff is in the sheep side, but we don't really give uh, two craps about that. We're going to talk about the important stuff, which is the beef. <laughs> you would have heard of Sill. It's getting a bit of a rebrand. Um, and and that's, that's a big component of what we do, but the beef is the guts of it. So, um, beef progeny testing, where we get a heap of size, get a heap of cows, get a heap of calves, test the hell out of the calves. We do that across dairy cows and beef. We've got a cow project with a heap of commercial cows, and we follow those females through, tracking them through on their lifetimes. And we uh, do something quite quite jammy here. We uh, we leverage our dollar, which is already half leveraged with uh, levy money, and then we double dip again into the Australian pot, and we've got this thing called the Trans Tasman Beef Cow Profitability Program. We use a heap of Aussie scientists and help influence the pre plan model, which is where you get your beef and your bees. So um, that's the guts of the beef program. Right, hands up, who likes beef cows? Who's that? Yeah, we wouldn't be here, would you? Who's got beef cows? Okay, most, cool. Um, who'd like them but I can't, who'd like to have them but can't afford to have them? Right answer. <laughs> <laughs> Right, well, there was three key questions, and there's a few people in the room here that have actually been a part of, uh, of asking these questions, which is why we've got this program that I'm lucky enough to, um, to manage. And the first one is, what's the right type of cow for hill country? What does she look like? How heavy is she? Does she change condition and weight over the year? Or is she um, that cow that stays at 600 kilos, body condition score eight, weans a 300 kilo calf? Or is she that cow that uh, gets in car fairly, uh, what does she look like? How do we do describe her and in dollar terms? Two, what sort of cattle are required to smash market specs to do well in these new finishing performance um, factors? And three, can we have both? Can we have an unreal cow? And can that cow kill well? Uh, the progeny of that cow kill well. Is it possible to have high performance animals that are both maternal and terminal. So about those three questions, we came about this thing called the beef progeny test. We're testing bulls, and it's got three objectives. The first is to quantify the value of, uh, of investment in better bulls. These guys right now are paying 15 grand on average for size around, around the country. I'm a bull breeder, I quite like the sound of that. But <laughs> are you getting your bang for your buck? Two, demonstrate the tools, show how we're using them, and show the best practice way to use them. The third one is to improve the toolkit. So right now, have we got the right things there needed to make the most profitable decisions? Are we actually describing that beef cow well? Are we choosing the right animals, and are we able to do that with the tools we've got? But most importantly, do it on commercial New Zealand beef farms. And so we don't want to do it in research situations, little um, fat little cattle in small paddocks, we want commercial stations, and we're lucky enough to have uh, Richard Schofield here from one of those farms who can really um, put that answer, that question to the test. We're doing 50 bulls a year. Some of those are just yearlings. Others, well, they're you know, 10 to 12 year old size. So they've got high accuracy versus low accuracy. And uh, this most recent cohort, we had 11 breeds. And um, we're doing that across 3,000 females. So we. We uh, give them a heap of drugs, they all, they all sink, sink up, like girls in a, in a private school, um, boarding hostel. And on they come and we just smack the sea lamb all on the same day. Where did you learn that? <laughs> yeah, how would you know? Yeah. Their expense would be for them teaching you that. <laughs> Might move on. <laughs> this is Tiatani Station here, 3,000 hectares, 30,000 stock units dry. Summer, uh, summer property, and this is down the Hack of Elliot Cab Buffet, uh, which is, they've got pivots, irrigated, fodder beat. We've got as much variation as you could possibly put to test these cattle um, to challenge the genetics. 
these are the farms. So like I said, we've got Richard Schofield here um, at, from Fongarau Farms with 75,000 stock units. A um, couple of thousand cows uh, across the, on the property we look at, we just say I-800, just a casual 800 cows. And um, a dry, dry summers, but sort of pr pretty, pretty warm winters on, on hill country there. Really cool property, test bulls. Rangitike, some people have described it's a bit like the moon. They get 150 day winters, it's pumice, it's cold as hell, but shit, when it grows, it grows. They get our best beefy cube hit rates, just about, and, and our best fertility rates. These guys really know how to feed cattle at the right time when it counts. But a big variety, and of course, um, this is our dairy farm, which we, we do a heap of cows there too. So if there's a chance to challenge those genetics in a number of environments, we think we've got that part nailed. These are some of the boys. Great photo of you there, Richard. Thanks, thanks. Yep, you deserved that after last week. Um, James Van Behamen here from Rangitike. This fellow's 26. He's managing um, property with 2,500 cows, uh, stock managing, uh, 10,000 ewes over in a, 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 the you know, New Zealand's biggest uh, deer herd, 6,000 um, deer. He's on fire this fellow. Um, it's the people that are helping us tell the story. It's the people that are making this job work. So we've got all those calves, and we just record the hell out of them. So in the, in the dairy beef situation, we just measure the calves uh, for their calving yeast performance. Then they come through, we just weigh them as often as we can. Um, if we just take the heifers, we're, um, we're looking at those heifers, how they are going in terms of puberty, but also uh, you know, how easily they're getting in calf and returning to calf. What do they look like is going on as cows? Are they fat, are they skinny? Are they heavy, are they light? Are they weaning good calves? And they're doing it year after year. Um, and then of course we've got um, the steer side. So those cattle coming through, we scan them, ultrasound scan them, look at their back fat, muscle, intramuscular fat. We kill those cattle, we look at their structural soundness and we go on and we look at as much as we possibly can. Right, I've got this idea that you've got to bake your bread before you butter it. So I've just got to repeat this basic message that what we're doing is, um, is actually working. Because if you can't prove the tools, then how can we do anything with the tools? Bake your bread before you butter it. I really should get Richard up here to do this. He presented it last week and does a far better job than I would. Right, you're paying attention? Three balls. Ball two, in the middle, he's our ball average. He's our ball with an EBV there of 40. Ball one, he's below average at 20. Ball three at 60. What's the difference going to be between these balls and the weight of their calves? What's the difference going to be between ball two and ball three? Question. Answer. 10, 10, 10, 10, kilos. 10 kilos. How come 10 kilos? Well, they get half from the, you get half of the EBV transferred from the ball through to the progeny. Perfect. 10 kilos difference. The ball was half the genes. Right, and there you go. We'll put it on that table there. Fair enough. Ball one with calves 10 kilos lighter. I'll take the first one. Right. You're, you're, you're with me? Yeah. Top me and Matt. That's fine. Yeah, I can understand that. Yeah. That's where you're from. And then, <laughs> and then of course, we're going to put some weights up there. Right. We're just going to put just average station weights, weaning weights. Ball two at 235 kilos. That's what we're going to call that. Ball one, 225. Ball three, 245. You're following me. I'm oh, hoping for some more nods. Right, we're going to put it on a graph. Each one of these dots is just those balls that you just saw. That middle dot, that's the average of that size calves. That dot there lines up with an EBV of 40. Here's a bull in the middle. Here we go, our calves at 235 kilos. Our bull, bull th um, three at 60, three EBV, bulls at 245. See? Comprende? Sorted. But of course, that's just the average. These are spread. Some calves are heavier, some calves are lighter, but on average, we expect the size to perform that way. The important part is a slope that says 0 0.5. We go up a kilo in EBV, but we only get half the benefit, so we only go across half a kilo in actual calf weight. 500 grams, slope is 0 0.5. So when I show you the actual, how the bulls actually lined up to how their calves went, you're looking for that 0 0.5 in the perfect world. And what do we get? 0.49, we missed out that mouthful, I'm sorry about it team, I've really let you down. <laughs> We're pretty stuck with that result. So you, get, so you get bulls that have a lower spread 
and some books of a driver's grid, or is that just the mathematics and not the average? Typically, the range is the range is fairly um, the range is the bit that that changes, whereas the average won't so much. So there are bulls with with a, a definitely a, a wider bell curve than others. Yeah. So that's our line, our actual, and there's our expected. Our slope is zero point four nine. The cattle lined up pretty well, and then we looked across the traits. That says that's a cattle that has yearlings. Four hundred days. We got four hundred and ten grams. We weren't too far away. Not too bad. And then of course at 600 days, 0.45, the kettle lined up pretty well across all those traits. From that, we, we believe you can have confidence to use those EBVs when selecting kettle. And if we just put it in another way, it depends on how you're bent, you're, you might be more numbers orientated. We hope for one kilo, uh, sorry, we hope for half a kilo with a lift in ABV of one. That was our outcome. So if we just put it up, line it up, 90% of size EBVs turn to actual car performance. <coughs> And across all 18 traits we looked at, that was 73%. Of course, growth is well recorded. We've got lots of information behind growth. People like to weigh their kettle, or at least we hope they do. And um, so we're getting a pretty good result. And what we're doing is that's across high accuracy, low accuracy size, over five breeds in this cohort, across these two cohorts, sorry, from um, cattle from Gisborne to the Hacker Valley, 2,200 commercial cows. There was a big range in the way we could test those and they came out pretty well. So let's just say we're, we're happy enough. And there you go. The difference between the heaviest sire and the lightest sire for cattle at 18 months, at three bucks a kilo, 66 kilos, 66 kilos, yeah, 198 bucks a calf. Well, hands up who can afford not to take that money. Hands up who would like it. <laughs> We're done. You can go home now. Okay. Hands up who's got it. <laughs> who's using the right balls? Who's using Napatahi balls? Well, that's out of it. <laughs> and we'll, we'll, tell you a diff we'll tell you a story here, the tale of two balls. Richard tells us a lot better, but I'll, I'll just repeat it. Sorry? <laughs> you got me. No, that was a, that's a dad joke. That's a real bad dad joke. <laughs> no one's actually picked that up before, you really. We expect, uh, expect it from Lincoln Great, so that's Yeah, cool. radio. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> right, so here is Cy Griffin at 150 kilos. He's right at the top of the breed. A lot of Cy Harris, um, he's right at the bottom. That's their EBVs. And if we stick this on here, this thing's called a percentile band stable. We, this is actually our roadmap. We can actually plot out and see the spread of size. So if we, we come along to here, we'll find Harris. What did he have? Is it 40, 59? We come across to the bottom 1% or top 99, whichever you prefer, he's at 58. Can someone there tell me top 10% IMF breeding value? Bang, go. Sorry? Top 10% IM for IMF. Just make sure it's bang. 2.9. Right, you ready? Bottom 10%. Bottom 10%. 0.4. 0.4. Yeah. IMF? Yeah. Come down, we're looking for top 90%. 0.4. Easy enough to see? This is your roadmap. This tells you what's a good one and what's not such a good one. The numbers can actually move quite a lot before you realise that you've changed the percentile. Right, you've got that there. Let's put some number, some dollar values on it. How much better were Griffin's calves? They were 66 kilos on average better at 18 months. That's 198 bucks a head. If you put that across the year, let's say that side has 40 calves, that's 7,000, that's 8K. He has, he go, he's used for three years. We've got an extra almost 24,000 bucks there. Well, how'd you say it before, Forbes? Who's actually getting that right now? Who can afford not to have that? But we're to make sure we're going in the right in the right direction. Because if you're scuttling off, you're hurtling off, sorry, on that uh, on that path, and you're really shifting your growth. You're making a lot of gear to gain. You're like this uh, the skier here getting pulled out by the um, ski boat. If they're going hard, you'll go hard too. And then two generations in leg, you'll make a big jump quick. But you want to continue to do that. Make sure you're going the right way. I'm sorry I've seen this before, but this was in Scotland a couple of years ago at the World Angus Forum. 
And uh, can anyone guess, guess the weight of that bull? He's 24, just about 24 months. Can anyone guess the weight of him? Keep going. Wow. Keep those down. Are you talking about you or the bull? Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? 1300. Very close. Just a little bit shorter. Yeah, this bull was 1278 at 24 months. Of course, he's had his head in the feed bucket the whole time. What, what's a typical weight presented? I'm not going to ask you to, you don't feed your cattle very well. But um, <laughs> now let's hear philosophies. I actually might need a philosophy. How much, to, how much would he expect a two year old bull to be presented at, typically? Yeah. 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 Even 800 would be an excellent, an excellent way to pull. It depends on what your program is. This bastard's huge. He was cut out of his mother. Oh, no. His, his mum's a thousand kilos. And they, these guys don't even use EBVs. We can, we can change our kettle pretty easily. Does anyone know what this thing here is? <laughs> what is that? What breed is that? Beltex. And she's got tits. That's a U. Unreal, eh? If you want to change animals, you can. This thing here, this is a, this is a, um, what do they call him, a tup. Um, yeah, he's a ram hogger. He was hyperventilating. He was just way overcooked and enormous. This is, um, these are potentially the fattest rams I've ever seen. I don't know if anyone can trump me on that. Um, <laughs> this is more Beltex. Have a look at this fella's eye. God. <laughs> <laughs> I keep looking forward to it. Pop eye, no hood, no protection, they get scared at the side of their own shadow. So, <laughs> we're gonna watch because if we really want to shift stock, we can. We're gonna make sure we're doing it in the right direction. Can someone tell me what this breed is? No? Nice. Wish you had some stuff. Very different. What do you notice about those things? <laughs> <laughs> Look at those ears. If your ears aren't six inches, you ain't got a shit show in the show room. <laughs> For what? Turning the rain. Right, turning the rain. Very importantly, Tom. Um, and this thing, do you know the farming bison in there? Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to put that picture in there. Got a size of his neck. Unreal. If we want to move stock we can so have a have a think about this thing uh, rmpp have got a new um, tool out um really cool that's the kpi benchmarking book yep. has anyone seen it yep. no you've seen it you're couple right. who's in an rmpp action network group every group should be working through it taking ownership of your financials it's free to the group mm -hmm. rmpp are paying for it music to my ears beautiful and actually get in an action network you've almost missed your chance that stuff, that's free money for farm consultancy stock type stuff. But a few people here in the room who, are, who can facilitate those things. Really cool. And um, so pretty much what we're looking at, yep, you can, you can continue to increase the growth in your cattle, but there are going to be consequences. What, what typically happens as we, as we choose cattle with higher growth, same machine, what happens in it? Harder yeah. carbon, exactly. What else happens in them? The bigger, bigger mature way. Yeah, the cows get bigger. And I heard, yes, yeah, so we've got. Oh, we've, got the the we've got maintenance requirements, we've got size of the cow, we've got weight of the calf at birth, all sorts of consequences. So we want to make sure when we improve one thing, we consider the change in others. And that's where we can use a thing called the dollar indexes, which I'll get to. But if um, with this, if you have a, a bit of a look at this one, all you need to do um, at weaning, and at, at mating, just go, you've got 100 cows, just do 10. Why well, go away 10, 10 of your cows, okay? And um, record the number of cows you mated. And then at weaning, all you need to do, you've got 100 cows, you've got 85 calves, I don't know, half of those are heifers, half of those are bulls. Just go and do 10 steer calves, 10 heifer calves, and weigh them. And stick them in here. You can even go, and there's a tool on online, Beef and, the Beef and Lamb's got, it'll help you to benchmark. So you can see, this was, this was my herd here. Um, th this was us. We are really looking to improve the weight of our calf relative to the size of our cow. So, you know, because the benefit is only captured if you're moderating your cow. Anyway, I'm actually just going to flip through these, because it's a bit of a muckery. 
but this is a little example on how you can change the size of your car filter of your cow and ensure that your benefit is captured. On average, we're looking at a 33% for that on a herd efficiency. So that's what, that's what um, people are doing on average. But of course, that's going to depend on your country and the like. Or another way to look at it, for every kilo of uh, cow uh, live weight mated, you get 33 back in calf weight. Has anyone seen these things? Yeah. Who's seen these? Do you know how to use them? No. No? No idea. This is your, um, your dummy's guide to the, to the galaxy for um, mating cattle using EBVs. Right, I told you about that percentile bands table. So that there, when up the side, and it's quite hard to find, like, you know, you're trying to find the bottom there for that. Well, this is that here. This is our bottom 1%, or someone would call it the top 100%, which is like a euphemism. It's like saying, oh, I'm sorry, um, your dog passed away rather than your dog got hit by a car last night. It's just a nice way to say the balls are down, down the, the arse end of the, of the percentiles, or up here at the top 1%. In the middle is our split. So cattle in the average around the middle, if they go towards the right, they're ranking well. If they go towards the left, they're ranking not so well. The end of your bar will line up with your percentile. So for example, for, um, we'll go here for docility. This bull here, he's in the top few percent. Easy? Of course, not every trait we want to, towards, the, towards the right, but for most of them we do. Can, you, can someone tell me there, all these groups of traits are coloured. So for example, the yellow ones are our carving ease. Our green ones, all of our growth traits. The red ones there, that's for fertility. And the blue ones are for a carcass traits. Purples overall, we'll come to that. These bulls here have equal dollar indexes. They're considered equally profitable. A dollar index is a combination of all those traits, but with dollar values on them. So for example, a calf this year might be worth a thousand bucks, but an extra kilo might be worth, I don't know, three bucks fifty. So all of those different factors are put in a soup and we get an overall dollar value. So we've got two bulls here, they're actually considered equally profitable. Which one is going to be useful for heifers? This one here? Yeah. Ladies man, which one's going to kill your heifers? <laughs> this bull? Because all those yellow bars are even that way? Which one's going to have the best growth performance? What's his name? Yeah. Intensity. 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 Happy camper. Intensity. Um, green, towards the right, you're winning there. Um, and and you know, so quite quickly we can just see, look at this, and you can tell what sorts of bulls they are. Easy enough? So sometimes the risk is that although bulls are equally profitable, one is all good for heifers, and the other one is going to have, is going to be an awesome terminal bull. Right. Do you know Peanut Slab or Whitakers? They're in their sixth year in a row for being New Zealand's most trusted brand. How do you get there? Sugar kills more people than anything else at the moment. <laughs> How come they're all stoked about these guys? Peanuts are good for you. Peanuts are? Peanuts and palm oil. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Whitakers have got this incredible reputation as New Zealand's most trusted brand. How do we make beef kettle all this taste pure nature thing? Has everyone seen this taste pure nature? Anyone who hasn't seen it? You're not going to say no, though, are you? <laughs> this thing here, we're going to slap it on um, our, our meat products overseas, and that's going to represent our New Zealand ink and all the good things that we stand for and our story to tell. My challenge is that how can we make that like this? Because if they can sell sugar, surely we can sell red meat. <laughs> it is no joy. No joy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She's pretty good. Because, <laughs> <laughs> oh. well, no, she's great. She's great. <laughs> <laughs> who, who, knows, who knows who these people are? You one with grey hair, of course, is going to know. Yeah, yeah, all the oldies put their hands up. <laughs> one's David Longy. What's the other one's name? Roger. Yeah, the inventor of Rogenomics. These guys pulled the rug out from farmers overnight, 1984. If you want a, a, an interesting book to read on, on that topic, talk to Mark Warren. Um, these guys pulled the rug out overnight. We're not going to get that sort of support. Not, not like the Yanks getting right now. So Trump said, 
oh, you know, I'm, um, I'm screwing you with trade with China, so you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to boil your crops because your crops are failing this year. We're not going to get that sort of subsidy, that sort of um, support from our government. It's been made very clear in the last few weeks. So we've got to do whatever we can to get ourselves across the line. And sometimes it's just about telling stories. So, so Ryan, how important is animal welfare? It's, it's very important. It's, it's number one. It comes, they come before us. You know, we're passionate farmers, we care about our animals, and you do what you've got to do to make sure that they are looked after. It's swinging over to uh, Ryan Foley from Horizon Farming, and we had a, um, we had a storytelling day about all the things that are really basic that we consider um, just sick of nature. Like this idea that um, townies or vegans would love our animals more than we do. How can that be possible? How could they, how could they have more empathy for our stock than we do? And like just that idea, just as simple as saying, our stock get fed before we go to bed. You know, they come first. That's just basic for farmers. That's just entry level shit. And um, we're not getting those wee sound bites across. Um, and, and my argument is that it's people like this that, that can help tell the story. Because what we've learned is that farmers are, are heuristic, and that's just a fancy word for saying they learn from others. It's from experience. So you go to a farmer in the year field day, we get 250 people. We have a beef protein test field day, and we get 40. Far out. Where are these, what are the, why aren't these guys coming to have a look at what we're doing? And um, the big part of it is that farmers like to learn from other farmers, and it's quite simple. But these same fellas can help tell our story, that the authentic, genuine story that actually helps us, helps connect with what we're doing, that real basic stuff. And um, so this is why we talk about guys like James Van Bahamen, um, 26, managing one of New Zealand's biggest stock operations, and just doing it, no problem. And he's, we, these are sorts of people we're getting to tell our message. And because like, how do we encourage people to measure? Because like going and doing that KPI booklet, it's actually not that hard. It's quite easy to go and weigh a few cows, weigh a few calves, make, do a little calculation to actually benchmark where you are and where you might be going. So um, put this idea up, and this is a John North quote, who's a breeder in Warra. We said, some like food, some like cropping. He said, I like cows. But how do you inspire people to be objective about the things that they're not quite so keen on? And our theory is, well, without subsidies, that you make it competitive. And um, you put people head to head, you stick them in the RMPP situation, and you really get um, fellas bouncing off each other. And we're really enjoying doing that. But it's that same theory that, will, that I believe will help us when we go towards consumer. This is an example of the beef EQ situation. Right, if you're blue, that was the percentage of your kill that didn't hit the specs for reserve grade. This is this new eating quality thing with Silverfern Farms. If you, um, the amount of your kill on yellow is the percentage that did hit. So for example, if we look here, these are two different kills of 30 head each at Cabify Station, one at 95%, the second kill at 95%. That's nuts, that, that performance, because the average is like 33 or something like that. These are guys that fight to beat, all the cattle are dead, at 18 months, they're doing like 320 kilos carcass weight, massive fat, smart link, all that stuff, pretty cool property. But across all the farms, like we take like, for example, Rangitike, um, you know, there's 2,000 cows there, and they're managing to pull off percentages that have been improved if kill on kill, because we're sharing the information, we're making it competitive, and these guys are learning from each other. We can learn from each other, but also townies can learn from us. Gary. One to five across the bottom, what are, they, are they just kills throughout the year? Individual they, kills, yeah. yeah, that's, yeah. Kill that's, one, kill two, kill three across the season. It's not, it's, 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 it's essentially time series. Yeah. And as part of that, we're doing this project, we've talked about it, we're saying how we're double dipping with the Aussies. Quite smart, actually, um, to be able to do that. And describing this cow, using their science and our science, and this thing called breed plan, it's producing EBVs, and, um, and, and really do as much as we can to measure these animals because it's these things that the information that drops out the bottom that we can use as ammo in this debate. You know that um, Bob Dylan song? Times they are a changing. No one's quite read that here, they? <laughs> Bugger, I was calling heifers. <laughs> 
No, yeah, we got that, we've got that. If my, when the market price for this low for your heifers, I just decide to tell the buyers and identify as stairs. LGBT. Yeah. LGBT. <laughs> you know, we, the, the world's changing. We wouldn't have accepted that 10 years ago, that sort of talk. But the world's changing. The language they use is changing. <laughs> What's that chop doing? <laughs> <laughs> oh, geez, I didn't say it. <laughs> so that that um, we, we've got to try and fit into this box because what um, the the way that we're being um, you know the ballpark we're talking we're actually in different ones and we need to bring them back and also um, make our part in our story communicatable. It's quite interesting. Um, has anyone read the Eat Lance report? Have they heard about this? Do you want to hear about this one? These are a whole heap of vegans um, and vegan activists or eco-warriors, whatever you want to call them, whatever label you want to put on them. They said, we've got to cut. This is like Harvard endorsed. This is like world leading research apparently. It says we're going to cut out our red meat consumption by 80% if we want the world to last. 80%. It has, no, has, has nothing to do with our taste pure nature story, what we're doing in New Zealand. As far as they're concerned, that stuff's coming out the ass of this thing. And, you know, we're being compared to high fossil fuel using industries, and that's all being compared to. It's quite scary. And this idea that we need to measure, we need to um, progeny test and measure animals, because it's those metrics that fall at the bottom we can use in the, as ammunition, but also we can use as selection to improve our, improve our stock. And so um, these are just two things that beef and lamb have been pushing, which I, I rate. In 20 years, we've managed to um, reduce our livestock emissions by 30%. And we haven't even selected for it specifically. We've got um, a third of all our native bushes on New Zealand sheep and beef farms. It's these stories that are weapons, that are ammunition in this, in this debate. Um, has everyone heard about this methane thing? Ooh, 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 ooh. The, the, the government's got away with that so far. It's just shocking, incredible. They've included methane in the net zero carbon bill, and what they're saying is that uh, it can't be offset by trees. But that's not okay right now. So, so what do we do? So fossil fuel industries, um, people using lots of fuel, oil, they're able to use our trees, but three quarters of our ag emissions comes from methane, but we're not allowed to offset them on our own farms. So now's the opportunity to use genetics. These things here, they're not Darth Vader cows or anything. Like these, um, these are girls in Ireland, and we're right now exploring options like these to select animals using our progeny testing to find ones that are more greenhouse gas efficient. So, which is quite convenient because if you actually, what we found is if you improve your dollar index, you'll also increase the greenhouse gas of, um, uh, reduce the greenhouse gas emissions from cattle. So that's the one positive thing um, out of this. But what we can do is we can really highly record these animals in small situations, subsets, and then what we can do is leverage that using technology called genomics. Are there any stud breeders in the room using genomics, or any commercial ones? One, two, three, four, five, six. These are the guys you want to be buying bulls off. People who are using all the information to make the best decisions. Um, those people are leveraging situations like ours where, it's, where we can do that and we can invest in recording this this stuff, but of course they can't. So they leverage it using this genomic technology. Um, this is a, an ex Max, the science is here to deliver an EBV for, for methane, but, but the, the, there isn't a part in the industry that can deliver that back to us. There isn't this, sorry? There isn't a, an industry that can take that science and, and deliver us back the EBV. So, so the technology is there, but we can't get it. Yeah, well, like so, so our genetic evaluation beef is done in Australia, and we supply information, and they turn it into breeding values, and we can help use that stuff. But right now, we only have a very small say in how those EBVs are presented and what EBVs are used. Um, so, you know, our sort of work could potentially be included in a breed plan, or we could do our own thing to help New Zealand farmers in another way. But either way, this thing is is important. Does anyone, can you want to work out what this is saying? 
This is the Irish, they reckon, okay, your indexes go up, so this is your overall profitability of the cattle. What it's saying is that they're becoming higher growth, but they're also still moderating or make, even making your females smaller. The indexes, the top of these bars tells you high, how high the index is. This blue line was their estimate on how much greenhouse gas they're producing. And what they're saying is that as your cows get more profitable, your greenhouse gas goes down. So that was their, their modelling. Now what they've done, they're like, sweet, what we'll do, we'll test that. We'll get a heap of cattle that have really high indexes and a heap of cattle that have really low indexes and we'll measure all the feed that goes in them and out of them, their feed efficiency, and we'll, um, we'll actually, in a feed bunker situation, in a feedlot situation, we'll measure their breaths. We'll say which are more greenhouse gas efficient um, and which are less. And what we're hoping is that the ones with high indexes, that'll be the case. The ones with low indexes, that'll be the case. Right, I've talked about the sustainability part um, and now the greenhouse gas part. Um, the welfare component, or like the people telling the story, there's also this thing called meat inequality. And right now, if we, there's too much steak that's been produced that is um, having immeasurable or unsatisfactory experience, experiences with the consumer. And we've got a real opportunity to do this. And progeny testing, getting a heap of bulls, getting a heap of cows, making the semen and, and recording the calves, those calves, hanging it up in the abattoir, this is the good stuff. And this is what's gonna take us forward on not just the whole story, but on the stuff you put in your mouth. The more we can do with this, the better. Right, where to next? Brian was weak to cut me off a while ago, um, but he likes beef cows. Where to next? Um, we're, we're currently applying for funding to the government. We're at the end of our four year round. And so if we want to do this stuff, if we want to maintain relevance and someone to speak up for the beef cow, um, then we need to make sure we get, we get this money. And so what, what, we're, what we're doing, we're investing in this greenhouse gas, also health traits like parasitology, all that stuff like um, stock that have lower wound burdens just um, from their breeding and um, getting into the efficiency, a plus what we're already nailing. That's our next big thing we present to the government next month. But here's hoping. Um, our intention is to build some of our own infrastructure and actually start recording commercial cattle. So if you've got a herd and uh, you have that thing called the mandate to measure, you actually like being objective about your cattle, weighing a bit, um, maybe even in, in, interested in improving your cow herd, A mob or B mobbing your cow herd on actual EBVs and performance. Like Richard Schofield here is doing at Fongarau Farms, fills a whole herd into A and B mob on actual, not just on who's the fattest cow or you know, which is the heaviest calf, on genuine performance, then we can do that. Um, and that's quite a next generation thing. But one more thing before I go, um, we're going to show this new tool we've got, which is called Improve. And um, this is a sheep tool, and we're developing this for beef as well. This is just the front end for what we call sill. Um, I'll just talk you through here, there's a little video on, on how you might screen rams. Right, so you've got a couple options. You can say select terminal or maternal rams. Um, and we can, we've got an option for, to select from a number of different traits. So here we've got maternal worth, the overall dollar index. We're going to say we just want sheep in the top half. We're going to have a look there at reproduction. We're not going to quite go to the top because we've already got pretty top lamb percentage, but we want decent reproduction, more lambs is better. Lamb survival, that's important. We're in hill country. We're going to look after the little fellas. And you can see that as we change our weighting on emphasis on traits, the number of animals reduce. But actually, we're quite interested in maybe body condition score or womb feck, those things that also health traits are important to us. And we can see as I do that, our number of animals changes. Um, so we, we're going in here, and now uh, we actually say, no, we just want to look at rams from the Bay of Plenty. We can choose that. A number of animals, of course, changes again. We might even be interested in, um, in, in going a little more detail and say excluding some flocks because you don't want to owe sheep, or maybe, um, or maybe uh, uh, putting more information here. We can see it, however you want to present it. So it might be, you want to look at the percentile, you know those bars in sheep, or maybe you might be interested in looking at the actual number, so the dollar value for the index. Depends on how you bend it, your numbers guy, your colour guy, I like colours. So here we go, we've got a few breeders here that fit our criteria. 
And so this top fella here, like 80% of, uh, is it an 80% match for our criteria to the Rams he's got? He's got 67 irrelevant uh, Rams, this Ram breed at the bottom. And we're just screening things based on our objective. Whatever is driving you on farm, you can choose um, via the Rams that become available. And we go to more information here. Yeah, these are the rank ones that fit. Oh, we 34% that fit your um, um, eternal worth requirement. We've got John Brown, he's got these rams. Go and look them up, we can find them. Just a way to screen all those things. And if we want to, we can say, look, we're actually just interested in breeder, this guy here, and this top fella. We're just going to look at the rams from those breeders. So these are a few sheep, a few rams. Um, you could choose to have more information on those coloured bars, but you quite quickly flick through the rams that are most like your criteria at the top and the least towards the bottom. So this is just a, um, this is a mock. This is what's going to um, be available potentially. There's been heaps already of consumer testing, like just commercial farmers, stud guys, and if you want to have a go on it and you're interested in, in, in being a part of the feedback, let us know, because we'd like to include you in the feedback already. We've done hundreds of people already, and on a heap of different occasions, because what actually it's ended up being is quite different to what we initially thought. So, um, But this will be ready at the end of the year, and um, we think it will make things a lot more transparent. Is this going to replace Flock Finder? Yeah, Flock Finder's only really just at an entry level at the moment, because you can't go into individual animals and breed these. So. But yeah, Flock Finder's all built into it. Right. Bake your bread before you butter it. Do the basics well. Um, we need to grow our champions, those people who are also our top farmers, because farmers are from farmers. Those people are also the ones telling our story, <coughs> connecting to the consumer. Your idea that if you want to go hard, you actually have to start measuring. And uh, we recommend that you get involved in these RMPP groups. They're a lot of fun. And to rebuild our trust, to make the Taste Pure Nature brand the Whitaker's Peanut Slab, we need to be sustainable, we need to look after our cattle, tell the story well, and of course, um, have a mean eating steak. Cheers. Bex, you didn't touch on the self replacing index and the Angus Pure um, heat index. Water. Just from the one I heard um, Sandra before me say that they are recording this so that they can get it back and they do want you to ask questions through the microphone, please. Sorry. Yeah, Max, um, I'm hoping you'd just touch a little bit on the likes of the Angus Pure Self-Recording Index and also the um, what is it, Meeting Index or the actual um, meat side of it. Are you going to start, is that the next stage that doesn't have time to explain? Because that's something that, that makes it very, very easy to select um, stock now. So is that something you've got time to spend a little bit or is that just a whole new lecture? Yeah, well, like, because I had those two balls there, there was uh, intensity, and uh, ladies' men, and of course they had different ranges of traits, although they had a very similar dollar index. And um, you know, we've got an Angus, for example, you see you now there's the self-replacing index, which is a very much maternal index, and the Angus Pure Index, which is actually a maternal index with a few carcass um, you know, emphasis uh, traits within there. And so it's just simple really, you just need to make sure that your objective and the things that you want to move are the same things that are being moved by improving your dollar index. So that's pretty easy. You can actually look up online. It's got there's a, a, a graph there that says, if you choose the bulls on this, how much will it change in your cows by trait? So if you go hard out on this dollar index, say it's pure, then will you get this much more carving ease or this much more growth and the like. So it's a real good way to get a bit of a, bit of a feel for it. Which website's that on? It's on like for either Angus New Zealand one or though, um, for the other breeds and other dollar indexes, it's on their individual websites. Also, I think PBB's got some stuff there too. Yeah. Thank you. So Max, at the start you um, had the slide which sort of um, asked whether or not there's an animal that can do both the whole maternal side of things as well as um, the traits which is traditionally seen in a terminal sire, um, you didn't actually answer is whether or not you have um, found the perfect animal to be able to do both those things and how um, your terminal breeds stacked up against your maternal breeds. Um, yeah, so we just don't have quite enough data to answer that yet. 
And, um, if, but if we look at just it on terminal, um, typically we're seeing the terminal breeds uh, that we use, which is Simmental and Charolais, they are almost definitely outperforming the other cattle on growth. We don't like to talk about breeds specifically because we use lots of different bulls within breeds, and it's a big range. But um, we are definitely seeing that, that um, an increase in performance from that side. And at the end of the year, we would have, have two matings and two calves on our first cohort, so we can start to see, are those bulls that are killing well? Are they also producing good daughters? And so we're not quite there, but um, I would have liked to have answered that. But yeah, breeding's a beef breed to me, so. Thanks, given, given that most of the um, dairy, most of the beef stock, well, over half originate in the dairy industry, um, what's, what's the kind of um, approach to get this message across to dairy farmers? Because that's going to have a real influence on the stock that we can buy as, as weaners or yearlings. Um, the handbrake is the dairy companies in terms of getting those size out there. We've seen quite a big upswing in the use of AI, and um, which is of, of, of beef AI, um, and that's really cool. And when you get things like sex semen comes around, we can say, well, our favourite cows, we, those breed the females and those breed the replacements. We do an AI period with beef as well and say even tail up with natural bulls. We're going to start, we think, and start seeing some better changes there. There's some really established dairy beef bull breeders. Um, there's a couple in the room, and, and those guys are doing a great job because uh, we've validated that, we can know that we can get cattle that are calf real easy and they grow like stink. Let's go get dairy farmers to use them. Cool. Time for beer. Do you have any more questions? <laughs> we've got time for a few. Am I allowed one minute? Always, It's Brian. dodgy. I know. Hey, look, was, look, the question was asked um, at, at Field Day on Friday, <clears throat> and you've got the percentile bands there, and it's Australasian, so it's Aussie and New Zealand cattle for Hereford and Angus and the other breeds. So, is there any difference between you know just having a New Zealand percentile band one and, the, and an Aussie one? So a, about five years ago, we pulled out. And we said, and this is just in an Angus context. I'm sorry to bring, keep bringing it back to Angus, um, but we you know we did did a comparison, and actually the cattle are pretty similar between New Zealand and Australia. We're now seeing some quite big leaps on the Australian front where those cattle are starting to move ahead of us. And we're seeing that through the Angus side benchmarking program in Aussie and, and where those cattle are starting to rank. So in Aussie, um, the top 20 sires are in the top 1%. And so the bulls that you have are having the most progeny are from the top of the food chain. And that is almost definitely not the case in, in pretty much all of beef breeding in New Zealand. So I, an opportunity. Does that, does that answer that well enough, Brian? You've probably got a comment too. You, you go, are you sure? Yeah. It's Mike Cranston from, um, yeah. Here's the go, Hereford Breeder. Um, encouraged to hear the commercial EBBs from commercial data. Is the opportunity to tap into LIC and those companies to? access their data with EID, it comes as basically a large progeny test, does the fact we've only got half the genetics supported, uh, i.e. the ball information make up for, uh, the large numbers make up for the fact we've only got half the genetics? Yeah, pretty much. Like, to do kettle for genetic evaluation, we're getting into the weeds, but genetic evaluation, you know, when they're born, who's your daddy, and which group you came from. And if you can do those three things, you nailed it. But with the dairy data, we know we can get a few of those things. And if we just get a big swamp, big like heave of information, and we throw that in there, then we're going to get some usable stuff that we can select cattle from. Because more is better, and more is better if you don't have details. So we, we've been working with those people for a couple of years. Sometimes politics kicks you in the guts. Thanks, Brian. Yeah, thanks, Max. Um, it's been great. To, to get an insight into beef and lamb genetics and on the beef side of what they're doing. As you can see, there's a whole big, big range of um, topics there that they're, they're batting up front for us on. So, Max, just a wee token of our appreciation. Oh, cheers. And that's just no trivial that there for you. Oh, yeah. New socks. New socks, yeah. And joke. Hey, look, um, I've said we've got to put our hands together and clap. <laughs>